Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Saudi Arabia continues to undergo one of the most intensive and exciting periods in its recent history with domestic reforms and foreign policy ambitions. To discuss the latest developments, I'm joined here in the studio by Ms. Paula Sleer, who is the Middle East Bureau Chief at Russia Today. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Nir Boms, who is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of Saudi Arabia today. Over the last century since the First World War, the House of Saud survived mostly by being very conservative and by hedging its bets, bets in various ways, including paying uh, those organizations uh, who uh, could risk uh, its rule. Uh, but over the last couple of years, ever since uh, King Salman took over from uh, King Abdallah, and King Salman being the last of the sons of uh, Saud, of Ibn Saud, uh, to rule the kingdom, we have seen the rise of uh, his son, Mohammed bin Salman, and various um, changes, uh, perhaps a transformation of the kingdom from uh, uh, more rights uh, given to women to uh, bold and uh, perhaps adventuresome uh, forays into foreign policy, be it uh, in Yemen or vis-a-vis -vis Qatar and uh, other places. So Saudi Arabia obviously is the place to watch as we enter 2018. Ms. I think we have a Middle East now that's essentially post the defeat of Islamic State. And that opens up the arena for rivalries, regional rivalries to come to the fore. Saudi's biggest rival is, of course, Iran. And I think what we're seeing playing out in more and more proxy wars, whether they're happening in Lebanon, whether they're happening in Yemen or in Syria, is the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I think different countries are hedging their bets and taking sides. And a lot of the Saudi policies are determined because they're frightened that Iran is trying to extend its influence into the region. And so they're making decisions based on trying to stop that from happening. Dr. Bombs. And to make it even more uh, dramatic, last week uh, we've heard uh, the Saudi foreign minister in Davos uh, speaking about uh, this, these dynamics, and he describes two paths in the Middle East, a path of light and a path of darkness. Saudi holds the sword of light, and on the other side uh, stands the evil Iranian empire uh, with a path of darkness. And the argument, uh, of course, uh, is a political realist argument that goes throughout the Middle East. Let's see, he says, you know, wh what Iran is doing in the Middle East, uh, looking at uh, Hezbollah, looking at Yemen, uh, looking at Syria, looking at uh, crossroads and paths of terrorism. And Saudi Arabia is really trying to be on the right side of history and trying to stop it. But they realize that uh, doing that is not enough. The only way to try and stop and put a different path is also to try to open the society and deal with some very significant issues from within, which has to do uh, with radicalization uh, and with the conservative elements that uh, this uh, particular uh, crown prince believes that uh, needs to be changed. Mr. But, but the question is, can Saudi Arabia be defined only as anti-Iranian or as trying to lead the anti-Iranian camp. Uh, this is not enough. There are other forces um, at work. Um, in Saudi Arabia, two thirds of the population are 25 year old um, and less. Um, of course, it's the uh, Shiites versus the Sunnis, the Sunnis being um, the uh, Saudis, the Shiites being the Iranians and other people uh, in the Gulf. Uh, but one should also uh, uh, see the, uh, the forces which could try to tear Saudi Arabia apart, the Eastern District, uh, the, um, the Southern District uh, bordering uh, Yemen, which is part of the reason the Saudis are involved. In, in Yemen against the Houthis because they are afraid that uh, uh, tribes of uh, a similar ethnic or religious affiliation uh, living in Saudi Arabia would link up uh, with the Houthis. So, and um, if you add to that the uh, fluctuation in the price of oil, um, there are uh, major and perhaps dramatic events there. Uh, Saudi Arabia used to be the number two exporter of oil to the United States after Canada, now it is number four. Because the Americans have made Iraq take the place of Saudi Arabia, the Saudis, of course, want to drive up 
the price of oil, which is why they are for a dramatic cut in production. But uh, the Americans don't want to be dependent on it. So even though President Trump started his term in office um, by a visit to Saudi Arabia with pomp and circumstance. Yeah, but it also has to do with the uh, aspiration of Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, to diversify the economy of Saudi in, Arabia. Indeed, but you see, um, a month or so ago, in, in December of 2017, President Trump, uh, following in the footsteps of Secretary Tillerson, had to um, condemn Saudi Arabia for its behavior uh, towards Qatar because the Saudis uh, refuse to um, uh, compromise with Qatar and end uh, this uh, uh, crisis in the Gulf. Ms. Lear? I mean, you made the point that the Saudis want to be on the right side of history. I'm not quite sure what that means, but I think the Saudis really just want to ensure the survival of, of, of the House of Saud. And when you, we've referenced here, looking internally in terms of the world and the drop in oil prices and trying to improve the economy, because of course that leads to dissatisfaction. I it's, think for the sake of our viewers, it's very important also to know that the House of Saud, we're talking here about more than 30,000 people. It's not just a house of uh, 10 or 20 people. It is a significant force within the Saudi uh, monarchy. And, and leading on from that, what I wanted to say was that the Crown Prince has two challenges. Internally, he needs to strengthen his, his own position. So you had, for example, those the the crackdown on corruption. But essentially, that was also him trying to eliminate rivals and kind of get a better control over the private sources of wealth within, within Saudi Arabia. The, the protests that happened recently in Iran were protests about people there being unhappy about the economy. People... Uh, people in Saudi Arabia were watching closely because those kind of things could happen in Saudi Arabia. But the crown prince has to have a handle on that and has to keep control of that because he is both popular and unpopular at the same time. Dr. Bombs? The crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, em emerges as one of the most dynamic leaders uh, of, of the era. He is young. He seems to be hip. He has uh, fancy boats and one of the most... Uh, expensive homes uh, in the world. Uh, being a Saudi prince is uh, not uh, similar to being a prince elsewhere. And one of the problems perhaps of Saudi Arabia that there's a country that used to be uh, perhaps too rich to its own benefit. And it really means that all of these princes, about five thousands of them, uh, some of them are richer than other states uh, within the region. And that also meant that the Saudi influence sometimes had reached uh, different directions than the Saudi kingdom wanted because people were literally had access to money and resources so they can support their own militias and they can send their own uh, uh, aid elsewhere even if the Saudi's kingdom or the, or the king at the time did not really confirm. This is partially connected to what you have just said before. Uh, if the uh, new crown prince would like to establish its position, one of the things he does, and that's connected to this big corruption scandal uh, that so far seems to have yielded about $100 billion to back to the treasury of the kingdom. And that means that now he is able to control the money rather than uh, some of the other uh, 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 former allies. And this is still ongoing. There are still about 90 uh, uh, individuals seems to be locked at uh, uh, Ritz-Carlton. Uh, and when this is all over, it's supposed to give him uh, an additional uh, uh, grasp of power. And at the same time, it gives him additional validity to begin to open up the system internally a little bit more. And we'll have to see how these two shifts uh, parallel shifts that are in some ways contradictory uh, will work out in the future. Ms. Lear? You know, we talk about the reforms that he's bringing in, but there's a lot of criticism against these reforms as well, that it's a lot of pomp and ceremony, but what does it really mean on the ground in terms of changing the situation? I think we're looking at a crown prince who maybe is modern, who maybe does want to improve the, 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 the obviously wants to improve the economy, but he's also fighting for his own political survival. And one of the ways he's doing that is not just internally, is also you referenced the war in Yemen, which has, has been disastrous for his reputation and was something that was on his clock and that the Saudis are now world in that. It's costing them a lot. And it comes against the backdrop of the world's cut in, in oil prices. There is now talks about $1.3 billion that the Saudi uh, monarchy is going to uh, grant uh, humanitarian agencies within Yemen, Mr. Olin. Yes, and that also has to do um, uh, with the blockade of, uh, of ships to, to Yemen, which the Americans came out uh, against because of the humanitarian crisis. But um, um, up to now, and uh, as long as uh, King Salman uh, is in power, uh, 
Uh, Mohammed bin Salman is operating under the auspices uh, of his father, the king. It is not certain that once Salman dies, unless he abdicates and, and uh, calls for the um, crown to be handed to, to uh, Muhammad, it is not certain that the other princes will sit idly by and see him succeed, leap over an entire generation, and uh, who knows what uh, he will do to, to people once he controls all the levers of, uh, of power. And we already saw what the way he handled Saad al-Hariri of Lebanon and the Palestinian billionaire Masri, uh, head of the Arab Bank. Uh, they also were invited, uh, as Nir said, to the Ritz Carlton. Um, probably uh, the best jail in the world to be incarcerated in. Uh, so um, while uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, can look like a promise, he is also a threat to the region. Dr. Bones? I certainly agree because a lot of this, uh, in a way, uh, transcends uh, uh, the uh, old modus operandi of uh, Saudi Arabia, and it is, appears very chaotic. Uh, and in many ways unanticipated. Uh, you know, we have other, uh, perhaps we have an era of uh, political leaders who seems to be somewhat erratic and, and uh, unanticipated. Uh, and perhaps that's uh, sort of joined the core. But I want to zoom out for a second uh, from the dynamic of the Saudi and goes to the Saudi message because that there's something very interesting here. And the Saudi message that, that, that what we hear uh, especially from some of the uh, prominent uh, uh, spokespeople for the kingdom, what we've heard in Davos, um, and, and what we hear about this modernization and reform is uh, perhaps more important than the actual development and who is going to be eventually the crown prince and how much uh, who is going to gain uh, from the political struggle inside the system. Because what we're beginning to see with women driving, with uh, reforms in, uh, uh, in the, the cultural sector, with uh, new openness in a number of things, which perhaps some of it is symbolic, but some of it actually has a chance to be more real, is irreversible. And it's about a call to say that we need to modernize, that uh, we need to have a different answer. Part of this whole idea of uh, 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 the 2030 plan, the economic plan, we no, we no longer need to rely on oil. We need to modernize the economy. We need to limit the number of foreign workers in Saudi Arabia. We need to get women to be even better educated. And we need to give women to be more integrated in the business sector and in every other sector in the society. These are things that are, in a way, an alternative. Uh, uh, a value alternative to uh, the alternative offered by either the Muslim conservative circle on the one hand and certainly Iran on the other. And this is uh, something that Saudi is now uh, with the crown prince bringing forward. And this is something that will probably stay and remain, certainly in the discourse, if not under the leadership of uh, the crown prince. Ms. Lear? But I don't think you can separate that from this regional rivalry that we referenced at the beginning with Iran, because the crown prince has gotten Saudi Arabia very embroiled in, in a war in Yemen. We have the Saudis on the losing side in Syria. We had this incident that you referenced in Lebanon. It comes parallel, let's say, for example, with the American administration of Donald Trump. They want they, they, they obviously are supporting the Saudis, and I think that the crown prince and the, the, the monarchy there is emboldened by that. And I think that that gives them some kind of confidence in taking on Iran in proxy wars. And I think that potentially is dangerous for the shifting balances in the region. Your bombs? Again, I'll, uh, I'll agree again. This is certainly uh, all related because all things in, in the region are. My main point was that uh, this path, some of it is probably irreversible. And the influence of this path of reforms is significant because there are other countries in the Gulf particularly who immediately follow the Saudis. And also when you're looking at public polls across the Middle East and across the Arab world, uh, it's, it's Saudi Arabia and the UAE that usually gets uh, the, the best ratings. These are the countries that people in a way wish to be there and wish to emulate mainly because of the economic benefits. Uh, that is a huge challenge. The Saudis understand that they, if they want to maintain uh, that status, they need to change and move, modernize, uh, and, and perhaps in that sense also to consolidate because without that it's going to be very difficult to shift this balance of power. Well, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, of course, uh, was the defense minister before being the Crown Prince and uh, did very bold moves uh, compared to his predecessors and uh, showed some kind of a new ambition, a, re a renewed ambition of Saudi Arabia to be the dominant force 
that rivals Iran on all sectors. Nevertheless, in the last uh, few months, as also Ms. Lear has stated, uh, it seems like Saudi Arabia is on the losing side in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq. Uh, to what extent does that actually influence the foreign policy of Saudi Arabia? And does that embolden it to take more actions to actually persist and push the Iranians back? If you uh, look back at uh, the policies of the uh, Obama administration, it turns out that there is a basic continuity, contrary to, pub to uh, popular opinion. There is a basic continuity in, uh, in policy regarding Iran, uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions, um, and of course the Saudi-American connection uh, because of that. Um, Obama and of course now Trump have been uh, openly against Iran getting a nuclear bomb, of course they understand that if Iran does go nuclear, so will Saudi Arabia, as well as others, Turkey, Egypt. Uh, and Nevertheless, the school of thought of uh, Trump's uh, advisors, the Secretary of State, uh, as well as the uh, Secretary of Defense, are coming from a Saudi perception, uh, talking about their previous positions. Yes, they, they are, um, but uh, you would uh, have expected the Secretary Tillerson, the Secretary of State, um, uh, to be more sympathetic to uh, Saudi views, and he is not. He is uh, perhaps uh, the, the least pro-Saudi uh, official uh, in um, the high uh, councils of the Trump uh, administration. And now, um, Saudi Arabia has always been a financial elephant, but a military mouse. And um, while uh, you mentioned proxy wars, this has always been the uh, Saudi way of war, um, getting mercenaries, a foreign legion. A foreign legion could be the U.S. Army. A foreign legion uh, uh, could be other uh, countries sending forces to help uh, the kingdom. What we saw up to now was that only Arab countries, not Iran, have invaded other neighboring countries. Iraq did in Kuwait and threatened Saudi Arabia. Iran didn't. Iran up to now has been very cautious. The revolutionary guards, of course, operate via their Quds force in, in Iraq and in Syria, but they did not send the Iranian Air Force, Army, and Navy to invade. So um, in many ways, the Iranian threat um, is less than, than advertised by the, uh, by the Saudis, but of course it helps the Saudis to portray themselves as the uh, uh, guardians of the Gulf or the uh, saviors of the region. Ms. Lear? The Saudi monarchy has very much aligned itself with the Trump administration and moving forward. But I think they were slightly taken aback when the administration picked them out for their blockade in Yemen. And although they've said they're going to lift the blockade, I think there is surprise that until now they've had kind of a, a, a blank card in terms of being able to act any way they want to there. They were also apparently taken back by the American president's announcement on Jerusalem. There's some speculation as to whether they were told in advance or not. But I think it shows the mercurial nature, not only of President Trump, but also of their alliance and their moving closer with the American administration. They do seem to be emboldened. They do seem to be acting more on foreign policy. But that has to be weighed up against an American administration that nobody actually really understands and is very, very unpredictable. Dr. Bones. And this is, again, a point in where they are more aligned in the, the idea of uh, acting without a plan, uh, trying to get a sense of uh, strategic uh, direction that is, uh, seems to be lost in the shuffle, making decisions uh, on the cusps and, and then trying to figure out why eventually they need to pay a price for them. Uh, and that, in that sense, perhaps uh, the two uh, leaders, uh, the Crown Prince and the President Trump, have, have a lot in uh, common. I'll have just to take an issue with uh, something that uh, Mr. Oren had said before. Uh, the Iranian uh, threat uh, or the Saudi perception of it uh, as these things goes, of course, they would try to uh, exaggerate as much as they can. But it's not true to say that the Iranians have not sent their own troops. The number of uh, boats carrying uh, bodies of Iranian uh, troops, including a number of Iranian officials, generals, and others in Syria uh, and, and elsewhere, are, uh, is, is, have been a part of the reasons for the recent demonstrations in Iran. Uh, by invitation. Um, I, the distinction is between helping uh, Bashar and invading a country without... Uh, 
uh, it's being uh, willing to host uh, the Iranians. But, but, that, but that particular view on the threat of Iran uh, has to do with really the Obama years, uh, the rescinding of the United States from the region, and Saudi's understanding uh, that it needs somebody needs to take the leadership. And once Saudi did that, uh, the region began to be more assertive. Was that actually the reason why King Salman, for the first time in history, decided to fly to Moscow to meet up with President Putin? I, it was certainly connected to it because the Russians have taken the leadership, uh, uh, have taken the role uh, of, of the wheeler and dealer in the Middle East when the Americans have resented it. Therefore, you need to work with the Saudis as well. And part of that uh, move was a signal to the Americans, look, we are your allies, but if you are not there, we may need to turn elsewhere. Ms. Lear? And the Russians have positioned themselves saying, look, we are kind of neutral on the whole rivalry between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Maybe we are best positioned to act as some kind of mediator between the two. I think it's also interesting in terms of Syria. I think everyone accepts that, at least for the near future, if not for longer, the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad will be staying in power. And the Saudis have backtracked from, from insisting that he remove. They understand that a lot of their backed rebels on the ground, Saudi backed rebels on the ground, have actually been defeated by Assad. And so there's this closer acknowledgement and uh, and talking with Russia behind the scenes in terms of the day after in Syria and the, Syria, uh, and the Saudis wanting to be part of that understanding that, by and large, they've actually lost by having bet the side of the rebels. Mr. Uh, ever since um, the oil embargo of 1973, there has been a tacit understanding uh, between Washington and Riyadh that uh, they are on an oil for arms relationship. Uh, the Saudis will sell oil to the Americans uh, when needed, and the Americans will supply them with the most sophisticated arms, even uh, going to the mat with the uh, pro-Israeli lobby, APAC, uh, starting with the AWACS and other, other uh, uh, systems. But uh, what, uh, what happened uh, most recently is that uh, in Riyadh they found out that President Trump is not the only one calling the shots in Washington. The Senate, uh, with its Republican majority, is not pro-Saudi. There is a lot of resentment toward Saudi Arabia going back to 9-11 because so many of the hijackers were Saudis, because the Saudis have been known uh, to, uh, to pay um, uh, to Hamas and Al-Qaeda and others uh, in a sort of extortion. Uh, Senator Bob Corker, the uh, uh, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, uh, came out uh, with a statement saying that in the Saudi-Qatar um, um, debate if, if, or conflict, the Saudis are more to blame than the Qataris because the Saudis have been sponsors of terror more than the Qataris were. And the Senate has been blocking several arms deals which the administration uh, put forward. So the Saudis have a lot of work to do to convince legislators in the United States um, of their case, regardless of uh, how the Iranians are portrayed as even more negative. Dr. Baum's last point on this? Well. About a decade ago, there was a, a very famous book, uh, Bint Riyadh, that was published, a girl in Riyadh uh, that was written by an ex-Saudi who escaped to Lebanon and became a hit throughout the Arab world. It was about the life behind the veil. It was about the parties late at night. It was about the real life and the quest for a generation to uh, uh, live in a different way. I think what we're seeing now with this entire dynamic is this generation coming to life and coming to light in an erratic way, in an unanticipated way, uh, and with an ambassador that we still don't entirely understand where he's going. He's not very experienced. Uh, he had made a number of mistakes, uh, but he survived. Um, and this is partially why this 21st century uh, is probably going to be the Saudi century. Uh, and the dynamics in the Saudi kingdom will be amongst the most, most interesting ones in the Middle East. Mr. your last point on this? It just won't be within inside the Saudi kingdom only. The repercussions will be echoed throughout the Middle East. And part of that change will be asserting a foreign policy, whether it's to take on Iran or whether it's to assert Saudi influence. But it will have repercussions and consequences that will be felt right across not just the Persian Gulf, but across the whole Middle East. Mr. Owen, I'd like to bring Israel into the picture here. Um, the new Middle East following World War II and the 1948 war with Israel started with kingdoms um, being changed into republics, kings being toppled, Farouk in Egypt, 
and the regent Abdulillah in, uh, in Iraq. And um, all of a sudden what emerges is that the Arab Spring has uh, taken place only in republics. The three kings, Hussein of uh, Jordan, um, uh, Hassan in Morocco, and um, uh, the various kings in Saudi Arabia, because Abdallah died and Salman took over, they all survived. And the question is, how can this Arab Spring or its aftermath uh, skip Saudi Arabia? The answer is probably, as Dr. Baum said, it is not going to skip Saudi Arabia. It, we will feel uh, an aftershock. There will be some, if not uprising, uh, some expression by this new generation that it wants to flex its muscles. And if Salman, if Mohammed bin Salman uh, shows that um, he is uh, of leadership metal and up to the task, Saudi Arabia will take its rightful place. If not, it will disintegrate. Ms. Sleer on Israel-Saudi relations? It, it's good for Israel. It's no secret that Israel and Saudi Arabia are moving closer together. They have similar, if not the same, goals vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis -vis terrorism. They're brought together by an American president who recognizes both of them as being on the same page. But having said that, it's still very hard for the Saudis to acknowledge a, a closeness or a friendship or a cooperation with Israel in public. And I think we saw that with the recognition, with the stump treatment, um, statement that he recognizes Jerusalem as the capital. The Saudis cannot come out and cannot support a statement like that. They have to still stand firm and be the protector of, of, of Al-Aqsa for the, for the Muslim world. One sentence. The Israeli government uh, seems to, to see the Palestinian problem is a footnote, that it can have a regional arrangement with Saudi Arabia as its center and only uh, in passing uh, take care of, of the Palestinian issue. No, it is a, a real stumbling block. And only after it is taken care of, the Saudi-Israeli relationship will uh, fully mature. Dr. Bombs? But even here, the parameters are changed because part of what you hear from the Saudis, sure, let's sort it out. The capital can be in Ramallah, the capital can, can be in Abu Dis, the capital can be elsewhere, but the issue is let's sort it out, we don't really care how. And that's sort of looking at the zooming out, this is a different perspective. Uh, we have seen things that we have not seen before. Israeli ministers, Israeli chief of staff writing for a Saudi newspaper, a number of other public uh, uh, forums, uh, and again, more reports on the non-public forums. All of this means that uh, this a uh, new era of relationships is more real. But of course, I agree with my colleagues here. You cannot ignore the Palestinian conflict and you cannot ignore the interests of the other side. Uh, the Saudis, I think, will uh, be able to emerge probably even more assertive as they've been assertive in other arenas. They can certainly surprise and be more assertive here. As long as the Saudis have uh, Mecca and Medina as the religious centers, not only for themselves, but for the whole of Islam, they don't really care whether their capital is in Jeddah or Riyadh. So they may uh, think that Jerusalem is religious rather than political. Well, unfortunately, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Ms. Lear, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Bones for coming here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.